Hey everyone, we are going to start off with the skeletal system in your course pack. This is on page 63. You may want to pause here and take a moment to jot down these five functions in your course pack on page 63. Let's start off with support. We know we have an internal framework or skeleton to provide support against gravity. So bones, as a hardened substance, help to create a, an internal support. Bones also provide protection for our vital organs. If you think about the cranial cavity, the skull protects the brain, the vertebral cavity protects the spinal cord, and on the ventral side of the body, we have the thoracic cavity protecting the heart and lungs. The pelvic uh, cavity provides little protection for those organs. Bones in conjunction with muscles produce movement. In fact, it is the muscles that pull the bones to make them move. Let's talk about storage for just a moment. There is some fatty tissue stored inside of our bone marrow. In the bone marrow, we have yellow marrow, which stores simply um, energy like adipocytes, but we also have red marrow, which serves a different function altogether. That red marrow functions in making new red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. We also have minerals stored in the bone too. Calcium, for instance, phosphorus, and magnesium are all stored in the bone. And finally, blood cell formation that takes place in that red bone marrow is called hematopoiesis. That special term, hematopoiesis, evolves, <clears throat> involves rather the creation of all blood cell types. That includes red blood cells or erythrocytes, white blood cells or leukocytes, and platelets or thrombocytes. Again, you may want to pause here and take a moment to write down these bone shapes on the bottom of page 63 in your course pack. The first type there are long bones are technically longer than they are wide. Short bones are square shaped. So let's take a look at long bones and short bones. Here you can see a long bone, which is of course something like the humerus or femur bone. These bones have a very particular structure that we will talk through in just a few minutes. Short bones are square in shape. Those would be the carpals and tarsals in the wrist area and the ankle area. Sometimes we talk about the patella, but it technically goes in another category. Flat bones are in fact curved bones. The uh, bones of the skull are flat bones, and you'll notice that they're made in a particular way. They have an outermost layer of compact bone and an inside layer of spongy bone. Sometimes people call this a sandwich where you have two pieces of bread on the outside as compact bone, the meat inside is called the spongy bone. In addition to your skull, the ribs and sternum are also considered to be flat bones. Irregular bones go in no other category, so the vertebrae would be a great one to add here. The sacrum and coccyx would also go into this irregular category. So would the scapula and the coxal bones. Well, they say we have 206 bones as an adult, but that varies from person to person. This is one of the reasons why. We're bone, born with bones that eventually fuse together over time. And here in the skull, you can see that the fontanelles grow together and create these multiple sutural bones. You can see the frontal bone is divided in half by a suture there, the sagittal suture, and the coronal suture separates the frontal bone from the two parietal bones. There are multiple bones here that have grown into these sutures where bone literally knits into bone. So for that reason, we can actually say that people have varying numbers of bones, but 206 is the average. So the only place you find these sutural bones are in the sutures of the skull. Sesamoid bones are another reason the average number of bones a person has is 206. These are commonly found in our movable joints. In fact, the patella is a sesamoid bone. It is a short bone, but because tendons grow through it to hold it in place, it is then classified as a sesamoid bone. So the key here for a sesamoid is that it grows uh, within a tendon. Those are found in our movable joints. So what you have on page 64 is a practice page. If you'll turn on over to page 65 with me, let's now talk through long bone anatomy. Number one at the top of the page is for the term diathesis, which is just a fancy term meaning the shaft of the long bone. 
The diathesis is actually making up the majority of this bone's length. The outer surface is made up of a smooth type of compact bone. However, the inside is hollow. We call that inside space a marrow cavity or a medullary cavity. Oftentimes we find yellow marrow in that storage space, fatty tissue. Now, the inside of that diathesis is lined with a type of epithelial tissue. You can see in this picture the endosteum, this term down here, is what lines the inside of the diaphysis. That, of course, is the hollow space inside called the mirror cavity that is lined by that endosteum. Keep in mind the terms here, end means within or inside, ost means bone, so literally this word tells you it's located inside the bone. For number two, the um, periosteum covers the diaphysis. The periosteum is a type of connective tissue that is very tightly adhered to the outer surface of the bone. You'll notice in this picture they are very closely associated together. In fact, the periosteum has Sharpie's fibers or perforating fibers that grow down into the bone. And that prevents the periosteum from separating from the underlying bone tissue. So imagine if you're walking through a parking lot on a hot summer's day. If you happen to step on chewing gum, you may then raise your foot and have strands of chewing gum attached to the bottom of your shoe. That's kind of how periosteum anchors to that bone. They are not meant to separate from one another. They are meant to stay anchored together. And the reason this is so important is because tendons and ligaments are anchored into that periosteum. If you pick up a heavy box, the last thing you need is for those uh, muscles, which are anchored to uh, bones, to separate away from the bone tissue. So that periosteum is very tightly anchored there. Now, osteoblast and osteoclast are also found associated with the periosteum. We know the prefix osteo means that these are some type of bone cell. The osteoblasts are bone forming cells. That means that they grow new bone tissue. So in fact, when we're adults, bone growth occurs from the periosteum on the outer surface of the bone. And osteoclasts are bone destroying cells. They are also found in the periosteum. So if you are less active than normal, your osteoclast may break down the bone. However, if you're more active than normal through exercise, your osteoblast may build up and thicken the bone. Uh, exercise, in fact, will cause the bone to become thicker and more strong. Number three's blank is for the term epiphyses. These are known as the ends of the long bone. These epiphyses actually form joints or articulate with neighboring bones. So we in fact have a proximal epiphysis that's closer to the point of attachment for that bone to the main frame of the skeleton. And we have a distal epiphysis, which is the farther point of attachment. So here you can see we're looking at a picture of a femur. This will be the proximal epiphysis that we're viewing here. Now, we don't have periosteum covering the epiphyses. Instead, we have articular cartilages. The term articular means joint. So we have joint cartilages covering the ends of our long bones. That helps to reduce friction and to prevent bones from rubbing against other bones. Now, sometimes this cartilage happens to be hyaline cartilage, as you find in your elbow. Other times it happens to be something like fiber cartilage that you find in your knee. But most of the time, when we're talking about articular cartilage, we're usually talking about hyaline cartilage. So you'll hear the term meniscus applied to the knee. That's the name that they give to these articular cartilages found in the knee joint. Here you can see also a picture of articular cartilage, the white substance there covering the ends of those bones on this chicken meat. That, of course, is hyaline cartilage and it serves to reduce friction as those bones rub against one another. You can also see articular cartilage here. It is a nice pretty blue color that covers the outer surface of the epiphysis of this bone. Let's talk about number five and six blanks on your worksheet. Number five is the term epiphyseal plate. The epiphyseal plate is a line of hyaline cartilage in the ends of our bones only present during our growing years. So if you look at an adult bone, you will not see an epiphyseal plate. Instead, you'll see number six, an epiphyseal line. 
Here you can see the epiphyseal plate. It is made up of hyaline cartilage, and right behind it is a zone of ossification. Those are osteoblasts found in that zone, and they are moving in a slow motion race trying to catch up with that epiphyseal plate. When you reach your late teenage years, the cartilage in the epiphyseal plate tends to slow down. That means that those cartilage cells tend to divide more slowly. That gives the osteoblast in the zone of ossification a chance to catch up. And eventually, that cartilage layer becomes ossified, meaning it becomes um, calcium deposits thanks to those osteoblasts putting calcium into that zone. So by the time you reach, say, age 18 to 21, there is no more lengthening of our bone. These are growth plates that are then eventually turned into hardened epiphyseal lines. So that's why we don't see people growing typically past ages 18 to 21. By age 25, that epiphyseal plate has been completely ossified and calcified by osteoblast placing um, calcium into that layer. So the epiphyseal plate is a growth plate. It is visible in young growing bone, whereas an epiphyseal line, that's number six on your sheet, that is only seen in adult bone bone that is no longer able to elongate and cause the bone to grow in length. Another great view there of an epiphyseal plate. If we were to look at an x-ray and see that epiphyseal plate, we would know that was young growing bone, someone younger than say ages 18 to 21. We would not expect to see this plate of cartilage in an adult bone. Here you can see an x-ray there is space between the femur up top and the tibia down below. And in the ends of each bone, you also see a layer right through here. That's in fact the epiphyseal plate. So because it's hyaline cartilage, it doesn't show up the same way on the x-ray. We now know that this is young growing bone, someone who's not yet, say, ages 18 to 21. What do you think happens to bone that is damaged in the epiphyseal plate? Well, that's the growth plate of the bone, so we know cartilage is one of those tissues that is slow to heal, maybe not at all. So if we damage the epiphyseal plate, there will be no more uh, bone growth in that particular zone. Now, the good news is there is an epiphyseal plate on each end of our long bones, so there could potentially still be growth from the other end. However, since this end may be damaged, we may see this particular end of the bone no longer elongate. If we suspect someone has stopped growing, we can do an x-ray of the hand. That exposes the body to the least amount of uh, radiation, and it gives us an idea as to what's going on with the bones. On the left, you can clearly see epiphyseal cartilages. On the right, those cartilages are gone, and we only see epiphyseal lines. So you can see in here there's lots of space around these carpals for them to continue enlarging in size. And this little region right through there is the epiphyseal plate. Those are two things that tell us that there is still potential for bone growth. On the picture on the right, however, you don't see those epiphyseal uh, plates through there. Instead, you see lines. And notice how those carpals, they're all knitted one right up against another. No more room for enlargement of those bones. So just a, a moment here to take a look. Um, which of these shows an epiphyseal plate? Well, that'd be the picture on the right. And what I'm looking for is a zone of cartilage right through here in the ends of these long bones. So that tells me this bone is still growing. This person is younger than ages 18 to 21. And on the left, we actually have an epiphyseal line. It looks like just a remnant of a plate, which is in fact what it is. This is a line over here on the left. This person is older than 18 to 21. So let's take a look at page 66. Now we're gonna talk about compact or osseous bone and another type, which you did not learn back during the study of histology, called spongy bone or cancellous bone. First of all, you'll notice that compact bone covers the outer surface of all of our bones. It is a smooth, dense type of bone compared to spongy bone here in the inside, which is very spongy in appearance. It has a lot of air spaces where bone marrow was housed, and that bone has a very needle-like texture. 
Here you can see a bone that's had the compact portion eroded away. The compact bone is this portion over here, and all of this that's now exposed has a very needle-like appearance, and that is the interior spongy bone. We are going to talk first about osteocytes. That is the blank for number one on the top of page 66. Osteocytes are mature bone cells. Osteocytes once were osteoblasts. What do osteoblasts do for a living? Osteoblasts make new bone, but unfortunately they actually build themselves into the bone that they're creating, and then they have to become mature bone cells, which are osteocytes. It'd be like building a home and accidentally walling yourself off and you have to live the rest of your life within that structure. That's exactly what osteoblasts experience. They become part of the structure that they're building. So osteocytes are housed in little air pockets, just like chondrocytes and cartilage are. The little air pockets are called tiny lakes or lacunae. Here you can see osteocytes of a mouse, and you can see these tiny canals that radiate off from that osteocyte and its lacuna. These canals bring nutrients, gases like oxygen, and carry off waste products to and from that osteocyte, which is housed in this little air pocket here. And here you can also see an osteocyte. It's a little harder to see the lacuna in this bone tissue than it is in cartilage tissue, but nonetheless, that osteocyte there is a dark spot. Used to be an osteoblast. It got built into these rings of calcium salts that are being deposited here, and it just retires and becomes a mature osteocyte. The number two blank on your page, top of page 66, is the matrix. The matrix of bone tissue is made up of calcium salts. So you can see there's lots of rings here that create the bone tissue, specifically in compact bone, and that is these layers or rings of calcium salts. The rings that you see here are called lamellae. So in the picture on the right, you can see that there's just like uh, layers of rings in uh, wood, these are, of course, lamellae going around here. All right, so let's talk about the structure of bone. You'll notice here that bone is composed of both organic and inorganic components. Calcium phosphate crystals make up the inorganic components. The calcium here, you'll notice, is the number one component of bone. But we also have things like phosphates and carbonates. So calcium phosphates actually make up around two thirds of your bone's weight. Calcium phosphate crystals combine with calcium hydroxide to form hydroxyapatite. Now, by itself, these inorganic compounds create a brittle but hard portion of the bone. So this is what we need. We need a combination of inorganic calcium phosphate crystals and hydroxyapatite combined with the flexibility of collagen fibers. Those collagen fibers make the bones um, less brittle, but they also make the bones flexible. So not that bones have a great degree of flexibility, but imagine what, if, what it would be like if you had no collagen in there to provide any flexibility. So collagen's making up about one third of the bone's weight, while these inorganic molecules make up around two thirds of the bone's weight. All right, so those are things that you'll want to look at. Calcium phosphate and hydroxyapatite is the majority of your bone. Collagen is a one third constituent of your bone and only about 2% of your bone's weight comes from those bone cells, osteoblast, clast, and sites. Okay, so if we were to number these or rank these in order, the most common component of bone is those hydroxyapatite crystals. The second most common component is organic, meaning that your body is making those collagen fibers, and the bone cells are in the far last place here. There are three types of canals that are found in bone tissue. Canaliculi are the tiniest ones connecting osteocytes together. The central canal is found in the center of an osteon. And then finally, perforating canals connect osteons together. So these are osteocytes in their little air pockets called lacuna, and they are connected together and back toward the central canal by way of these teeny tiny connecting canals. They're called canaliculi. Sounds like an Italian dessert, doesn't it? 
So these canaliculi are little teeny tiny canals connecting osteocytes to each other and also connects them back to the central canal. Here you can see a portion of an osteon. An osteon is this central canal here in the middle and all the rings that surround it. Do you remember what these rings are called? Those rings are called lamellae. Okay, so here you can see individual osteocytes. They're represented by these dark spots here. They are trapped in their lacuna. And these little radiating strands that come off the central canal here, those are canaliculi. They not only connect one osteocyte to a neighboring osteocyte, they also connect that osteocyte back to the central canal. This is how your osteocytes stay alive. They receive nutrients, blood gases, and waste products are carried away by these connecting canaliculi. So what looks to be strands here, these are not actually collagen fibers that you can see, but instead they're canaliculi. So they do radiate out just like a bloodshot eye here from this central canal. So now that we have the big picture, let's circle an osteon. This is an osteon. It includes these rings here that are called lamellae, and it includes this central canal in the middle. So speaking of the central canal, the central canal happens to be a haversion canal, and it holds a blood vessel or a nerve that travels through the center of each osteon. Now, you can see in this picture a perforating or a Volkmann's canal. This canal connects two neighboring osteons. What we're looking at is a central canal right there and right there, and this Volkmann's or perforating canal connects them together. So finally, in this picture, we get the whole set of canals that we've already talked about. You can see a central canal here. You can see rings that radiate out around it. That, of course, creates an osteon. The little teeny tiny canals that connect to each individual osteocyte are called what? They're canaliculi. And then here's a central canal and another central canal, and they're connected by that Volkmann's or perforating canal. So let's take a look at this picture. Here we have an osteon right here, and we have another osteon. These central canals are running the length of this bone, okay? So they're like elevators that go up in a really tall building. Let's say that you are uh, trying to get off on a 33rd floor of that building, and you get off and you say, I'm gonna head to this, this hotel room. Well, unfortunately, you got off on the far end, so you have to walk down this really long hallway, which is called a perforating canal, and that will connect you over here to this other elevator shaft. So when you have these pieces of canal that connect across, those are our Volkmann's or perforating canals. And if you think of elevators in a tall building, those are the central canals. And if there's a teeny tiny little hallway that goes to your individual room, that's a canaliculus. All right, so here we go. We've got our compact bone recognizable by these osteons with these central canals in the middle and these osteocytes that create um, a little space there, air pocket, called a lacuna around them. So what type of canal is this one down here? It's a perforating or a Volkmann's canal. And what type is this one here? That is a central canal. Let's wrap up page 66 by looking at the very bottom. It's spongy or cancellous bone. Now, you didn't study this one back when you talked about histology. We didn't talk about this one. It is a very spongy or needle-like bone in appearance. And it has these bony bars that provide strength that are called trabeculae. So you can see some of those bony bars right through here. It creates an appearance that we call diplo, just an alternate name for spongy bone. So cancellus or spongy bone is located in areas of our bodies that provide a conduit for stresses, such as in the uh, long bones that you see here. And then here is your term to jot down on your page 66. The bony bars that provide the strength in the spongy bone, they are called trabeculae. That is the blink for the bottom of page 66. 
Now, in these spaces here, this is not just empty airspace. There is actually marrow stored here. If it's yellow in nature, it's just fat tissue or adipose tissue. And if it's red marrow, it's going to be uh, performing hematopoiesis or making blood cells. All right, so just another view there of spongy bone.